It is a beautiful day to be alive, and I'm so glad we have this time together. I'm Sanaa Laybourne. I am a professor, scholar, connector, and avid reader. I've always loved learning about what's happening in our social world and sharing that knowledge, especially over a good cup of coffee. And so here we are. Each week on Let's Grab Coffee, I catch up with experts from across the country who are investigating our most pressing social issues and common curiosities. Over the next hour, you'll learn about their inspirations, motivations, and of course, what they know about the world around us. Go ahead and grab that cup of coffee and get ready for an engaging and insightful conversation. Child welfare services, including adoption and foster care, are often framed around the, quote, best interests of the child. But who gets to decide what's best and who's best for the child? When it comes to families made through adoption, the portrayal of children finding their forever families means that we hear these stories through the lens of adoptive or foster parents, leaving the voices of birth families, adoptees, and people who were in foster care silenced, ignored, and even discredited. In We Were Once a Family, a story of love, death, and child removal in America, Roxana Asgarian challenges some of the assumptions around child welfare and adoption. She centers the birth families whose children were murdered by their adoptive parents in a highly publicized 2018 murder-suicide, and it's through her investigative journalism that she exposes the harms baked into the child welfare system. Roxana was a law and courts reporter for the Texas Tribune. Previously, she covered the child welfare and criminal justice systems as an independent reporter in Houston. She received her bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Texas at Austin and her master's degree from the Craig Newmark School of Journalism at the City University of New York. She joins us today. Hi, Roxana. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thank you for having me. Absolutely. You know, as soon as I saw your book, I was like, oh my goodness. First, I have to I have to read this story, right, to really understand what happened and not just what happened, but also the families involved and not just through the ways that, uh, you know, kind of media circulated this very sens- sensationalized story. And I realized that I did remember this case, right? Um, but I didn't know much about the birth families or any other family member. Um, And so I was very much interested in reading, you know, this story more in depth and from a different perspective than what we normally get again through, you know, the lens of adoptive parents and and them as saviors and and through this lens of automatically, you know, vilifying birth families in a lot of instances. So thank you so much for all of your work. Thank you. And thank you for reading. Yeah, absolutely. So I was uh, telling you before we jumped on air that I, you know, formerly worked for Child Protective Services. uh, And then listeners, you probably know that I'm also adopted. And so this, you know, all of your work also piqued my interest, you know, from a very personal standpoint as well. And so I think what readers will, will really gather from this is what you've done so masterfully here is weaving in some histories of the child welfare system and really helping us to understand, again, the system that is really at the center um, of everything that eventually unfolded. Yeah, um, that's a really good, uh, I I mean, I'm glad that was your takeaway. You know, that was something that uh, definitely um, was a major reason for me writing the book versus doing a magazine story or something like that. Cause I feel like the overall knowledge of the child welfare system in, um, in our society is pretty minimal mm-hmm. and there's so many bad things happening in the system. And I feel like people don't have a frame of reference for how to even understand those things. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, I'm wondering if you could just start by kind of for our listeners who aren't aware of, you know, what your book is about or the the case that really is the center focus of the book. If you could talk just a little bit about um, about the Hart family, but also the children um, that are involved um, in this case. Sure. Um, so in March 2018, uh, a family was found at the bottom of a cliff in California, and it turns out that Um, It was two white women, a married couple, and their six black adoptive children. And it became clear that the the mom who was driving um, did it intentionally. So it was a murder-suicide. And the family was 
fairly well known in the Portland area. Um, and one of the kids had actually gone viral in a photo of him hugging a white cop at a protest for the Black Lives Matter movement. So um, it immediately got a lot of attention. Um, as you can imagine, it was extremely tragic. Um, reporting started coming out almost immediately about a sort of trail of abuse allegations that were made against the women over the decade that they had had the children. Mm-hmm. Um The way I got involved with the story was I was a freelance journalist in Houston, Texas, and I got a call from uh, one of my friends at The Oregonian, which is Portland's daily newspaper, um, and they had found the names of the birth family of three of the kids. So there are six kids from two separate sibling groups. And so the way that I got involved was uh, they asked me to knock on their door and see if they would give me a comment about what had happened to the kids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, as I was reading this case and and you kind of mentioned it, you know, these, um, these women, Jennifer and Sarah Hart, a married couple, they have these children for, you know, close to a decade. And there are a lot of allegations that are happening in the, in this, in the, through that time, um, but yet they still, you know, have adopted these children and are approved for adopting. As you mentioned, they have two sets of, of three sibling groups, um, and they're able to adopt that second sibling group, even as there are allegations of child abuse while they have the first set. Um, and I think that that, you know, as you tell this story, we see the many failures in the system. Um, and also the way the system is operating as it is intended to operate as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so all six of the kids are from Texas. And so I had spent a couple years prior to uh, getting this assignment, starting to dig into the child welfare system in Texas. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah. So when I got this assignment, I was kind of seeing it through that lens already. Right. Because um I I did a long form story about the federal lawsuit against Texas for how it's failing its the children in its mm-hmm. care. Um and that that's a lawsuit that's been it's still ongoing. So this is like 13 years ago now and thousands of documents, um multiple plaintiffs and I got to know really deeply like some of the, I mean, it's so alarming. It's so depressing to really read about and think about what's happening to these kids. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think, you know, that's something that it felt a little bit faded, to be honest with you, because the story was such a big national, um, you know, and it was like, I was, I was seeing it unfold in mainstream news and it was missing a lot of the components that I thought gave um that kind of deserve some accountability from the systems itself you know so we're talking about the women a lot we're talking about how they grew up we're talking about their sexuality we're talking about their psychology their you know and this is all a lot of this is conjecture because the women had a very sort of um they had a very public presence but they were very private people mm-hmm. and and there weren't very many people who actually knew them well mm-hmm. so i felt that a it was like a frustrating line of um you know the narrative was frustrating in multiple ways like the first way is that we can never really know like why someone does something terrible right, right. um and secondly that felt almost I mean, the action was horrible and there's no accountability there because those people are all dead, right? The women died along with the kids. Um, But then it's like, why? I mean, there's so, and then, you know, as it was coming out that there was abuse investigations, like, as you said, before the second set of kids were adopted, that was while they were in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. There was um, one of the women actually pled guilty to domestic violence for abusing one of the kids and uh serve probation then they pulled the kids out of public school they moved them across the country there was yet another abuse investigation in Oregon and then finally right before they loaded the kids up in the um Yukon and drove them to California 
they were about to be investigated yet again for, in a third state, which is Washington. Mm-hmm. And I mean, just even that, knowing that, and for listeners, of course, who probably haven't read the book yet, you know, it gives you a sense of what's happening in in these women's lives as they're supposed to be caring for these children, but also the ways that they were able to really evade um, some of these systems as well in a way that the birth families were not able to get out of uh, out of the radar of the child welfare system. Yeah. And that was so striking, right? I think this is, this specific story is, um, it's very rare that one story can really talk about so many different failures of the system because, um, there's a lot of problems and, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and so this situation, because it involved two birth families who had different issues, right. Um, because the kids were black and because, um there was such a clear difference in how the birth families were treated versus how the adoptive families were treated right like mm-hmm. those women were given chance after chance and the way that they got they were able to evade um you know having the kids actually be removed was they blamed the kids for all of the uh, alarming signs of their abuse mm-hmm. and that was such a galling part of it um, because, you know, they had this sort of, they were spinning a very public narrative on social media that involved their kids coming from um, not just poverty, which was true. The kids came from poverty, um, but they said that they were in really abusive situations that uh, they only knew cuss words that, you know, one Mm -hmm. of the kids was, shooting a gun when he was a toddler. It was like lies, you know, Um, but lies that people believed because exactly what you were saying about how the narrative of adoption is just like, we have one way to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And that way is saving kids, is finding forever families, Mm -hmm. is um, our adoption journey, but that's always through the lens of the parent, right? Mm -hmm. Their journey to adoption, which is such a to me, just such a fundamentally flawed way, I mean, you know, to talk about parenting generally, Mm -hmm. um, because kids are, kids are people and kids who get adopted, um, have their own journeys and those are really valid. And I think a lot of adoptees history gets, um, diminished or distorted if we're, if we're, if we're talking about the journey of their parents, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I mean, you talked about some of these different narratives and what I think you do so well in this book is to really challenge, right? The assumptions that we may hold or biases that we may hold that we're not even aware of when it comes to narratives, particularly about adoptive families or foster care and birth families. And I think particularly when it comes to children who are in foster care, we automatically think, oh, there must be abuse happening in the birth families, right? That these children had to be saved or protected from harm. Um, But as you mentioned, we have very little understanding of what Child Protective Services does or how they do it. So it makes it easy for us to continue these ideas of like, oh, this must be in the best interest of the child. But you show that you question that in this book. Yeah, it's so true that. um, And I really see that as a larger failure of journalism, you know, like I'm a journalist. And so that's my frame. Um, But I have often been frustrated. So like, so watching the story sort of unfold as a freelancer, and I was getting to know the birth families as this was happening. And, you know, I did a couple stories for the Oregonian right off the bat, right, which were breaking news stories. And I was struck almost immediately with, um, how, well, first of all, the grief that the parents were experiencing was so intense and overwhelming. And I could sense, well, first of all, they invited me in, right? So they mm-hmm. were like open, they wanted to talk. Um, they were extremely shocked and confused by 
what had happened because they had been telling themselves a story about how their kids must be doing okay, because that's what they needed to tell themselves in order to get through it. It was a huge grief that they had already experienced and were continuing to experience because they lost their kids. And so to find out, you know, it was like a double grief. It was the grief of finding out that their kids had been brutally murdered and the grief of understanding that they had experienced a lot of abuse Mm -hmm. while, you know, after they had lost them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you talk about in the book how, you know, birth mothers in particular, because those are, you know, the, the folks that you're talking to a lot in this book, you know, they don't, they're still mothers, right? Even though their children aren't in their homes, they're still mothers and they're still, you know, actively grieving that loss daily. Um, and, and what I thought was just so heartbreaking was the fact that birth families weren't even contacted. No one even told them what had happened. Yeah. Um, that for me was really, um, I was struck at a lot of different points at how little dignity um, Mm -hmm. they were shown in the process. So, you know, we see a lot about um, victims of crime in the news, obviously. And then we see um, families grieving a lot in the news. And I feel like in this case, it was, um, they weren't even allowed that space to grieve their kids. And, you know, um, so the first family, they're the Davis family. And this the second birth family, actually, those kids were adopted first. Um, and they're the Sherrick family. And I was able to track down that family six months after the crash. And um, I realized that they didn't know. So like, I, you know, I got some records from the sheriff's office that were publicly released Mm -hmm. and I found a, like a last name. And so I started kind of sending some people Facebook messages. Um, You know, they're in the Corpus Christi Christi area. That's where they were from. And so um, I got the grandma and she clearly did not know. She Mm -hmm. said, yes, those are my grandkids, you know, what's going on. And it was, um, you know, so I ended up telling her what happened and it was six months later. And this was a huge news story that people around the nation knew about. Right. And no one had bothered to do, I mean, again, those records, they were public, but also they came from the police Mm -hmm. themselves. And in this case, one of the, not all of the kids were found um, after the crash and some of them were found later, like after an extensive search. And so um, they actually were looking for, they needed the birth mom to uh, send a DNA sample so that they could um, confirm that some of the remains that they found was um, was one of the kids, Hannah. That's who they thought that the remains were. Um, and so when Tammy, the birth mom, found out she immediately submitted DNA. She, you know, they read everything about the case that was all over the internet. Mm -hmm. Um, They too were extremely shocked and like horrified. I mean, just beyond, you know, it's like hard, like beyond comprehension really, you know? Um, And so she did submit her DNA. That was a confirmation that the remains were Hannah's. And before they spoke to Tammy herself, they released a, a press release that told the nation that they had identified Han's body. And so it wasn't just the fact of like, they were neglectful to make the identification. It was like the initial thing, right? Like that they just didn't do it because they didn't know who it was. Like they knew who she was at that point and they still disrespected her in her grief Mm -hmm. as a mom and as a person who loves someone who has been murdered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you use the word that lack of dignity. And that's exactly what we see throughout this case, right? This lack of dignity, you know, and and even with what you shared, you know, they get the DNA, so they have what they need in order to kind of move on with the case or close this this piece of it and don't even have the compassion to say, you know, to the birth mother, right, what they found. 
Yeah, it was really um, like almost like radicalizing for me to see that play out, you know, because I sent her the press release when I saw it and mm-hmm. she said, why didn't they call me? The, the other major piece of it is both birth moms, when they gave their rights up, they did so with the understanding that something was going to happen that later didn't happen and things changed and they lost touch completely. So they both thought like in the Davis family's case, Sherry, the mom was told that she needed to give up her rights in order for her, for the aunt of the kids to adopt them because, you know, you can't adopt kids who have legal parents. And so they, they said, you do this. And then she, and then she gets to adopt, but two weeks shy of, the, the six months that you need to be in, you know, that the the pre-adoptive, you know, home, you need to have the kids there for six months before you can complete an adoption. Two weeks shy of that, she, uh, the aunt had to work and couldn't find childcare and asked the mom to watch the kids. And the caseworker stopped by, saw the mom there because her rights were terminated. She wasn't allowed to be there. Mm-hmm. And they were with the kids immediately. And that was that was it for that family. Mm. And, you know, I think, again, you know, there are so many things we don't understand about the child welfare system, particularly when child protective services is involved, Um, not just us as maybe outsiders, but also folks who are going through the system, right? You're in a state where you're concerned about what's going to happen to your children. Someone is telling you, okay, well, the best case scenario is for you to terminate these rights, and then they'll be able to go with, you know, a family member. And what you don't know is that they could go to a family member, or they could go to anybody and you don't get a say because you are technically no longer a part of their family anymore. Yes. I think that it's very clear that most birth mothers do not understand that what a termination means is that you are no longer legally entitled to know anything about your kid. In some cases, you're not allowed to know anything about your kid Mm -hmm. and you have no say Um, what they have told you might happen has nothing to do with how, I mean, it might work out that way, but it really, once you give up your rights, you don't, you know, this is what Tammy said, my right to know anything went away. Like, you know, I spoke to another birth mom while I was reporting this and she was like, you know, they, they expect you just to disappear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that that you don't like that the that the piece of paper says you don't care anymore and they just assume you don't care and you know that it's like the assumptions that are made when rights are terminated have like nothing to do with the reality of what it means to be a mom mm-hmm. you know um i have a kid and he was one when i started reporting this. And so it was so, it was just like, so obvious to me, you know, um, Mm -hmm. that it doesn't like, like a piece of paper doesn't make me his mom. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you know, I, I we have the birth certificate and all that stuff, but it's like, I'm always going to be his mom. That's a, that's a core part of my identity. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems like the fact that we assume that's not true for these moms is, is so loaded with judgment, shame, blame. Um, and a lot of times what these moms are dealing with already is their own childhood trauma, their own uh, conditions of poverty, you know. Um, and so it's just it felt really cruel to me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, throughout the book, cruelty. I mean, that really is what's happening, you know, at various stages throughout the process that you describe. And, you know, part of what really struck me is, you know, that termination process, that termination plan um, is happening oftentimes or being pursued at the same time that reunification is supposed to be also happening. Um, But it seems like particularly in this case, you know, you detail the ways that termination was really the goal for the people working this process, you know, through the pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. And how, um, you know, I talk about the courts that uh, that terminated the rights and sort of what was going on there. And like it, you know, the lawyer for the Davis family, she said, it's like an assembly line to them, right? Like this case, this case is one of 
hundreds on the docket and we got to clear the cases off the docket and what they think of as permanency, um, you know, like they truly thought that this example, like these kids, this was a win for them. They got them adopted, um, you know, two sibling groups of three. Those are hard. Like it's hard to adopt uh, to get sibling groups adopted. Right. But um, and so they, you know, they they kind of they were done and they thought, cool. And that was it. Um, and then they continue to pay the two women for monthly for the rest of those kids lives. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think it's really like it's really telling that permanency to a lot of people in the courts means permanent adoptive home. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there was a the Davis kids, they had an older brother that mm-hmm. didn't get adopted. And I felt like um, they kind of casted him they casted him off. Right. So it's mm-hmm. like it was a win, it was a win for them in in so far as they kind of check the box. It worked towards their sort of they get, you know, states get um, money for like beating their adoption goals essentially Mm -hmm. Uh, but there was a kid left behind and that kid was dying to be reunited with his siblings he never really understood why they were separated he was the oldest and he was acting out and they just labeled him a problem kid from age 10 Mm -hmm. Um, and his experience I I was so glad to include in the book um, because it it's actually it, it you know he survived he he's you know which which his siblings didn't but um he experienced such lasting harm and his tragedy is far more common in mm-hmm. the system yeah um i want to go back to what you said about the the courts because i thought that chapter where you're describing texas and and that specific court system um it was so infuriating to read that chapter um, and to think about the way those judges and, and the different folks, you know, in the system really were. It was about, you know, meeting a quota or, you know, clearing off your dockets, meeting these different standards and getting paid kind of considerably to do so. Um, and the lack of, of care and empathy and honestly outright racism that we see, particularly in that judge um, that you talk about, um, Judge Shelton, it was mm-hmm. absolutely infuriating. And I actually, and I had to check my, in with myself because it's like, this isn't just Texas, right? This isn't just <laughs> happening in Texas. This is, you know, in our state of Tennessee, I'm sure, or any other state where we have monetized and incentivized separating children um, and, you know, adopting them out and, and, and pursuing quote unquote permanency in a way that only can look one way. Yeah, I'm I'm really glad that you said that, that this is not just Texas, because I've gotten um, a lot of feedback that's sort of like, well, Texas is, you know, Texas. And it's like, well, OK, fair. And to some <laughs> extent, I get what you're saying. I think there's a flavor of of this that feels very Texan. Mm-hmm. I think Judge Shelton himself um, and his like big come and take it flag in yeah. his courtroom. And, you know, his his racism towards Latinx families and that kind of stuff. I feel like um, the specifics of that are pretty jarring. Mm -hmm. But I do think, though, that some of the systemic stuff that, you know, where um, judges appoint attorneys in the case and therefore the the attorneys kind of work at the pleasure of the judge. and in these courtrooms, that meant that they needed to salt, like, you know, get the cases off the dockets. Um, and, you know, multiple attorneys told me that they felt that they weren't able to do a robust defense because if they push back too hard, they would lose their ability to work in that court. Mm-hmm. And so that ties people's livelihood to whatever the judge wants you yeah. to do, which is like very fundamentally not how legal systems should work, you know? Um, and I don't think, you know, 
I think some of these problems are widespread. Mm-hmm. Um, there are states where kids don't even get attorneys. Um, they get guardian ad litems, which are, you know, uh, I mean, it's in some states, those guardian ad litems need to be attorneys, but not all states. And so, you know, the idea is that they're working again within the best for the best interests of the child, but not for the child's interests, which is a key difference. Yeah. Because if you have a lawyer and that lawyer is your lawyer, they're representing what you want. Mm-hmm. And for kids who are in a system that are like constantly shuffled around and have no agency in the choices that are being made about their lives, having at least one person in your corner saying, this is what they want. This is what the kid wants. You know, that's really valuable. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, and and that makes me think about um, about Dante because he learned very quickly that no one was advocating for him and that it was almost useless for him to to try to fight against this big system. Right. At every turn, you know, throughout the book and you're describing how he you know, wanted to see his siblings, he was continuing to ask about his siblings and, and his family. And, you know, no one ever made good on any of the promises um, that they gave him. No one ever followed up. No one, you know, connected him with any of his support system. Um, and so eventually we see, you know, his spirit just completely deflated because of going through this system. Yeah. And I think he you're right. He he knew at a very young age that these people were not working to help him. Mm -hmm. He knew he, he never wanted to be removed from his house. Right. And he knew that the only thing the people who worked on his case were doing were checking their own boxes. And, um, he has a deep hatred of CPS. He has a deep hatred of, and mistrust for anything really today that could help him actually. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Because he does have mental health issues and um, he's been incarcerated. He's, he's currently incarcerated again. Um, And so, you know, you need that kind of like, okay, job training and that kind of stuff, because it's really hard without Mm -hmm. that to be able to get like any kind of stability um, or job but he doesn't trust any of those people because he's seen that his whole life. And he's seen people who have said over and over that they're helping him while doing the things that are really harming him and turning it around on him and his behavior. Mm -hmm. And so that's the same thing that the heart women were doing to their kids, the state and the, and the, the case workers and the people who worked at the institution where he lived, they were doing to him. They were saying, if you want to get adopted, you better have better behavior. And it's like, mm-hmm. you're asking a kid who has been taken away from everyone who he who he knows and loves. Mm-hmm. He's taken away from his neighborhood. He's put into an institution where, you know, they count the number of socks in his drawer um, and they write down every infraction he does where he loses his temper or whatever. Um, and they're asking him to behave really well. Mm-hmm. In order to like, like, as if this is his problem, <laughs> right. you know, and like when Dante was 10 and he was removed from his siblings, he attempted suicide. And like, that's such a, that's the biggest cry of distress that, you know, you could imagine. But, but yet the way, like, the response to that was so punitive, you know, like you go to a treatment center, he's extremely over medicated, Mm -hmm. you know, in the psychiatric hospital, they would like medically chemically sedate him and other people in the place. Like, it's just, um, it's, it's horrific. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, seeing how he is as an adult, um, it was really hard because, you know, he didn't trust me. Like it took a Mm -hmm. long time, you know, to build trust with him. And, I often feel, I still feel this way, kind of like I have to start from scratch. Like we we don't talk for a few months. And then it's like, he's like, oh, I didn't think you'd be like, Mm -hmm. you know, what are you doing? And you get your thing that you needed. Like that's how he assumes that everybody is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, that's, you know, what he learned, right? He has all this data, right? From his own life that shows him 
that yeah, this he's is wrong. Yeah. I mean, he's not wrong. It's like, it's, it's hard and sad to think of um, the way that he sees things and relationships as very transactional and stuff like that. But like, he was not wrong that they didn't have his best interests in mind. They didn't, it, they clearly didn't. And, you know, they harmed him in a way that was really lasting. And, you know, Ultimately, he had a kid. I got to know that kid. That kid also got removed by CPS. And so we're seeing, like, again, another very common thing that happens where people who have system experience have children who end up in the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that was also so heartbreaking. Um, You know, you share that in the book about his own child and, and them going through him and his family going through, again, the system. What really struck me throughout throughout the book was how how quickly the Hart family was able to adopt in relation to how long the system took to make any movement that would have favored the birth family and favored that permanency. Yeah, and the ways that they come up with to not like favor the birth family, even when they do check every single box and jump through every single hoop, right? Because- <laughs> Ultimately, um, an aunt of Ye, who's Dante's son, was approved, got their home study approved. And this is hard to do, especially like in neighborhoods of high poverty, because like any criminal history, Mm -hmm. um, even if it's like weed, (laughs) you know, uh, like minor stuff is like disqualifying. Um, The condition of the home can be disqualifying. And so that means like, oh, you don't have an extra bedroom. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so like the aunt got approved for her home study and they still said no. Yeah. They said, well, she can have the baby, the you know, Dante's second son, but she can't have um, Ye, who's already in a pre-adoptive home. Like he has different needs that are different than, you know. Mm. It's, it's, it's so frustrating to read um, and to know that this is the reality of, whatever state we are living in, right? This is the child welfare system at work. Uh, Maybe it's not exactly the same flavor as Texas, right? But it is, it's the same system, right? It is a system and it is operating in this way, uh, regardless of of what state we live in or what it might look like in our specific county. Um, And, you know, for me, having worked previously with Child Protective Services, you know, I was thinking, oh, I can help children and families, but I quickly learned that, we're not helping children and families, right? We're doing a lot of paperwork. We're, you know, following these guidelines, but we don't have the resources to actually really help families stay together. Um, And I was like, I can't continue to perpetuate this system where families who are particularly in poverty are surveilled at a higher rate. So therefore, you know, that's who we're, we're punishing, we're criminalizing. We don't have resources to actually materially change, you know, these families' lives. And it's often not the goal to keep families together, right? It is about removal. And once, if that is the goal, then that's what you're going to end up doing is separating children and families. Yeah. I, um, I think, I think that your experience of like having, you know, I think a lot of people get in, I mean, I would say most people go into, you know, uh, working for the child welfare system because they want to help kids. And and they often have some personal connection to, um, you know, uh, understanding childhood, like, you know, the harms that childhood trauma can cause. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, that's how I got involved in this work too. Like I could understand, um, the sort of impulses of somebody like Dante, because, um, you know, like I understood the coping mechanisms of kids who aren't getting their needs met, you know? Um, but it's, it's so true that we have, you know, and this is also a public misconception that the child welfare system has supports, like support it, like, you know, they have quote unquote services, but those are services that the parent must complete and in order to do, right? So they're mm-hmm. like punitive minded services. Yeah. Uh, for instance, like if you're struggling to keep the lights on at home, 
and you know your kid gets uh has it, there's a neglect investigation and you're given a service plan and part of that service plan is a parenting class um are are the are you, a are you in a good frame of mind in that moment to like get things out of a parenting class when your when your kid has been removed when you're really 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 stressed out mm -hmm. um you're already struggling you were already struggling financially ahead of that and now you must be at a certain place at a certain time and if you're 15 minutes late they close the door and yeah. you get a mark on the thing and you know you get berated in court mm -hmm. like that's not or you know wouldn't it be really cool if like someone who was struggling to keep the lights on could get help financial help to keep the lights on mm -hmm. <laughs> like and what what would be better for the kid mm -hmm. you know if we're talking about the best interest of the kid the yeah. best interest of the kid is to have lights on in their home yes for sure it's also to be we have plenty of research that shows that it's also to be with their family <laughs> Mm -hmm. that's in the best interest of the child is to stay with their family whenever possible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, and with their community, if that's not possible. So in, in their extended family with people that already know them and already love them and can already give them some uh, stability and context in their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, when we think about ourselves as, as adults, you know, and how important being in the communities that we understand, that we are cared for, where we have supports, right? We know that this is crucial to, to our own survival and thriving as adults. And then just think about how much more important that is for a child, right, who is still developing. And yet, you know, we are committed to removing children from all the context and all the people that they know and that they, they, they love. Um, one thing that I really appreciated about your book Book was how you do talk about um, transracial adoption as well, right? Because this, in this case, um, is a transracial adoption. We have these two sets of, of Black children who are adopted by uh, white women and then moved to like the whitest of white places ever. And yet you see in the case notes where their caseworker has said, oh, you know, they're doing so good. They're culturally competent and <laughs> and they're, you know, connected to the Black community, you know, in their, in their neighborhood or in their town. And I'm reading this and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> like yeah, no like, they, have a, uh, they have a children's book on mlk <laughs> <laughs> that was a piece that i was like oh oh my god <laughs> but i mean I think that's oh go ahead well i was gonna say like that's a really um and i'm sure like you know i i, I mean i'm sure you can speak to this like you know i think it's something that's almost hard to talk about because there we have a long history again so like I do feel like there's a lot about this particular story that serves like as a basis to tell a much larger story about the system and how it came to be the way that it is mm -hmm. because you know again if you just individualize every single story you know, and then you move on. You're not taking the lessons that we've actually like lived through and accumulated. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're still just, we're repeating the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah. You know? And and I thought that was so important, right? So we, of course, we have this, this case at the center, but you're able to really illuminate the systems and the histories of those systems. Um, you write in the book, by hyper-individualizing the story, hear the story about the hearts, making it about one woman with dark psychological problems, the media largely let the state systems that failed the birth mothers off the hook. It let listeners and readers off the hook too, free to enjoy the wacky and bizarre tale without thinking of how it came to occur. And what I thought was so powerful about the book is that you don't let anybody off the hook, right? Uh, but I think that's so important because as we see continually, we see stories similar to this, you know, continue to pop up. And, you know, we have all these questions. Oh, why did this happen? How could this happen? But the systems have not changed. And if we took a look at the systems, we would understand why it's still happening. Right. Right. And I think, um, you know, there's no perfect 
people like in this story and there's no perfect parents generally mm-hmm. um you know i mean really and that's something and the other piece is like child abuse is real right mm-hmm. so like what you're talking about like systems that are because people will say like so what are we supposed to do? You know, you got to like when when kids are getting abused, what do you but the thing is if the system is not if if the system has been set up to surveil and punish certain people. Mm-hmm. And do you, like because we see th- that there are cases that go missed, right? A mm-hmm. lot. We see that a lot, right? So there's like abuse is real, it is happening. But that doesn't mean that like, you know, I've been doing a lot of stories lately about the sort of legal rights of parents during investigations. And it's like, ultimately, you know, it very, it is very similar to the police. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's a police function to take your kid. That's a, like a, um, a very serious police power to be able to come into someone's home and take their kid away. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's something that we have to, think about that through, through that lens and treat it with that kind of seriousness. Um, But because like, ultimately, you know, the UN definition of genocide includes taking the children of groups of people and giving them to other groups of people, like in the war between Ukraine and Russia, for instance, like we're, we're seeing current day stories of Russian forces taking Ukrainian children, quote unquote, orphans, right? And Mm -hmm. um, loaded term of orphan because, you know, you could say Dante isn't as a legal orphan, right? Because his parents' rights were terminated, but like, he's not an orphan. He has Mm -hmm. parents. And also um, that was like a state created role they gave him. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like, it's super important to understand how it came to be with the, with all of the racism and all of the sort of, um, you know, like the Native American, the genocide against Native Americans is like such a foundational part of how we came to think about taking care of other people's children in quotation marks. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um. And all that stuff, it's like, if you don't think about it that way, it's very easy to think, okay, that's a bad mom and her kid got taken away because she's a bad mom. (laughs) But like, you know, when you mentioned that, like, for like, you were talking about kids and trauma and how community is so important. And it's like, I have personal experience with that because I have childhood um, trauma, you know, and I... I had to sort of cobble together a community of friends and and friends, parents and other people that helped keep me stable and okay. And I was able to get through and out of that. Right. And I think about what would have happened if I wasn't able to have that community because that community really kept me safe, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, and like helped me build resiliency and we talk about resiliency for children but like you you have to the the true resiliency comes with support like no kid nobody should be dealing with it alone Mm -hmm. you know and no kid should be dealing with this stuff alone either yeah absolutely I mean I think this book gives us a moment to really question the narratives that we've come to accept about about children and families or, or child permanency and the child welfare system, but not just a question, you know, our own beliefs, but also to think about, okay, what can we do um, to make some sort of, of change? Because we see what the results of this system have been over decades, right? Um, so it is time to, to actually reconsider what can be done differently and then how we can become a part of that process. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, the two key things I think is like, we are a deeply carceral society, right? Like we Mm -hmm. have a huge mass incarceration problem, right? And I think we have an urge to punish people that we learn from a very young age. So this is a societal thing, right? It's no personal like, um, you know, but I do think there's a personal component to it. Because if you don't like question 
why the punishment feels like the most important piece. You know, when we're talking about taking care of children and again, abuse is real, like child abuse is real. And like, but when we talk about caring for children and taking care of them, we have to talk about like, what if, what, what if that conflicts with punishing their parents? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, cause we, we say we care about these kids and these kids are not being cared for. Like the kids in foster care are not being cared for. Yeah. And, you know, it's a rampant systemic problem. It is not, and I'm not saying that there's no good foster parents. I'm not saying that there aren't good intention people. I'm saying we we can see it all over the country in individual stories and in the numbers and the data. Like it's, we're not caring for these kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we got to bring more care into our daily practice, into our communal practices. Um, I'm wondering, how are you caring for yourself? I know a lot of the work you do is investigating the child care system, and that can be very heavy work. So I'm wondering for you, what are the ways that you're taking care uh, of you? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, it's looked different depending on the stage that I've been at in the process, um, where I'm at right now with it, you know, the book is done, um, but I'm taking a break on the sort of trauma heavy side of things. So I'm still writing about policy and I'm still, you know, doing that kind of stuff. But, um, I've been trying to, you know, because like I mentioned, I have my own personal trauma, you know, history and, um, this was extremely traumatic. Like this story was really, really hard to tell. Um, and, you know, I I want to be honest about that because it's like, you know, I think people, I think especially journalists like can mm-hmm. be like, you know, not about me. This is the, you know, and it's like, you know, the story isn't about me, but the work that it has an impact on me. And um. And I think we see it in the child welfare system with people who get really traumatized by the things that they're seeing and don't have the language or um, support or ability to process that. And then they end up either, you know, they leave (laughs) or which is probably, you know, often the the right choice or they stay and they get really jaded and they get really um, cut off from their emotions and their ability to like humanize people because they've done the because of the that's like their coping mechanism you know and so ultimately like that's a long way of saying I try I'm trying hard you know there's the regular therapy there's the everything that you do um and it's still like a process because ultimately you know if you aren't taking care of your own trauma that will bleed into the work you do Mm -hmm. um and you owe it to the people like I owe it to anyone that I'm writing their story I owe it to be present fully and to be able to witness them fully and so you know right now that means I'm not doing that because I don't I don't think I can do it you know um but I hope that I get to a place where I can you know do it again or I can do it in a different way you know the whole thing about stories is that there's lots of things happening in the world. There's lots of ways to tell stories. And so, you know, my hope is to still work with people who've experienced like state violence and do it in a way that can be, you know, sustainable for me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I'm so glad that you are taking care of yourself. Your work is so important. And thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. And thanks for all these really great questions. Thank you again to Roxana Ascarian. Her book is We Were Once a Family, A Story of Love, Death, and Child Removal in America. I just have to share a passage from the book. Um, and I think this really speaks to the importance of the book, but also to journalists as well. And it says, unlike many who'd investigated the heart's story, I was not drawn in by Jennifer's and Sarah's psychological motivations. What motivated me most was to see and to share the parts of the story that had been made invisible. 
the real and complicated families these children came from, the children themselves, and the involvement of a system that directed the course of their short lives, a system that remained unaccountable for their deaths. I think this book is an absolute must read for anyone who is invested in our children, for anyone who truly wants to see the best interests of children served in our country. Um, I was so moved by this book, and I know that you will be as well. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. This has been Let's Grab Coffee on WYXR 91.7 FM. I'm here every Monday morning having really interesting engaging and enlightening conversations with folks from across the country. And I hope you will join in on those conversations each and every week. Of course, if you missed any part of today's talk or you just want to listen to some pieces again or send it to a friend, make sure that you're subscribed to Let's Grab Coffee in podcast format. And I can't wait to be back here with you again next week. Well, I just want to leave you with this reminder each and every day you get to decide. Yes, you get to decide what type of day it's going to be and how you're going to show up in this world. Over time, it is those daily choices that create your life. So what type of life are you creating 